Now, I hope you all have your exercise books here. Can you just hold them up, please? Um, can you please write your name on uh, and your form? Now, uh, you joined year one at the age of five. So if you are, say, well, no one's over 40 here. Uh, but if you are 40, you are, uh, that means you are class 35. You're year 35, all right? Uh, and you can self-select the A, B, C, or D stream. So uh, can we have that on the front? And these are going to be collected in at the end and marked. Um, and Tatler are going to award a free subscription for a year uh, to everybody uh, who gets full marks on the test, uh, which you now see has been added uh, at the end of the day. All right. So that means uh, fiendish notes and anxiety, because I don't think that we can have anything about education which is not tested. Because if it's not tested uh, and measured and examined... Uh, it's not education, is it? So uh, we have something really important to talk about today. Um, and I salute Tatler, not just for its work uh, in organizing this inaugural and very important and very well balanced event, uh, thoughtful and uh, stimulating, entertaining, very well-informed balance of people, uh, but also for the work that it does in helping uh, parents and others choose schools. And the TAP, the guide, really is excellent. Um, and it is discriminating. And it doesn't just go on the basis of league tables, because league tables are too easy a game uh, for parents. And I'm going to give you the bottom line of my message now, uh, based on uh, a lifetime in schools, um, and that is that um, the best parents choose the school for the child, and the worst parents choose the school for themselves. It may be fantastic to get a child into Collet Court or to Marlborough, amazing places, or Eton, or wherever. Um, or Wellington, but they're not right for everybody. They are not, they are absolutely not right for everybody. And there is something terribly wrong about parents who will push their child at a certain school and stress and strain and extra tutoring, and it simply isn't wrong. Because if you can give your child a happy childhood, it will remain with them for the rest of their life. An unhappy childhood will make you angry and bitter for the rest of your life. Now, last night, I s happened to be chairing Toby Young, who was unhappy at school, Toby Young, the spectator, uh, and who, uh, whose best-known book is How to Lose Friends and Alienate People. Toby was not happy at school, uh, as he told us. It it's goes to the heart of who we are as parents. Now, my own mum and dad loved them absolutely dearly, uh, and I really did, and I miss them every day. Uh, but they, if they made a mistake, it was over the school. They wanted me to go to Winchester, and I just wasn't bright enough or good enough to go to Winchester. And I think part of me actually knew this. And they took me down on a Friday... Uh, to see the head and the deputy head. I don't remember very much about them, but they were very tall. Um, they seemed very tall to me. I mean, at the time, I, I was about six foot two, a age 12. Um, that was before my operation. Um, and and, and uh, there they were, uh, and there was mum and dad. Um, and I had just broken, earlier that week, my arm playing football at my prep school in Bickley Park in Bromley, and it was in a sling. And they said, what happened to your arm? And I s said to them, I promise, I said, I bust it. Uh, and when I said the words, I bust it, I think I might have said, didn't I? But I'm not certain I said, didn't I? <laughs> I certainly said, I bust it. I did see mum and dad look at each other with a look of absolute agony going between them. <laughs> and the next morning, the very next morning, there was a letter in the post with the Winchester uh, logo on it, 
Um, they didn't wait, you know, they could have waited <laughs> to Monday, uh, saying, we, you know, Mr. dear Mr. Mr. we did enjoy meeting you, uh, but we do think that Anthony would probably be better off somewhere else. Um, <laughs> the Ukraine or, or, or somewhere. <laughs> but but, but uh, they didn't actually say that. Uh, you know, and, and mum and dad were absolutely, bless them, they were mortified. And, I mean, it took me uh, till about lunchtime to, to, to if not 11s is, to, to, to get over it. But, but it, took, it took mum and dad about, about 20 or 30 years, uh, actually, to, to fully recover from this uh, trauma. Now, now um, in every other way, they, they were fantastic. But that is kind of making a point to me about, uh, about parents. Uh, and love uh, is about letting people be independent. And many parents think love is about making your children into mini-me's. They really do. I, absolutely. I know that. I've been ahead for 20 years. I see it again and again. I see fabulous examples of parenting. And I see misguided examples uh, uh, of parenting where uh, the parents, because it's great to go into work on Monday and say my child got into, uh, it, it, into this or that school uh, and it's great at dinner table circle, but it doesn't matter. You know, I'm going to say something really shocking here. Your child will pretty much get the same grades whatever senior school they go to. But if they go somewhere that is right for them, Single-sex day, uh, but don't just choose single-sex because that's what you had. You know, think about them. The best parents love and have that empathetic, imaginative sympathy that allows them to see what their children want. Okay, so that's what I feel passionately. Now, there, there is a split that's happened in education in the last 25 years. There's a, there's a school light um, uh, school version of schools uh, which says that schools are all about exams and testing and this is the only validator of schools and Ofsted uh, back this up um, and uh, they scrupulously look at these exams and now they're these you know, big eight subjects uh, that all that matters which you know th th that's what education secretaries uh, like because pretty much they came through that system and they're, they're, they're pretty much those pretty kind of guys you know that's you know their kind of world uh, they're not very uh, big hearted magnanimous I mean Ed Balls you know um, uh, not a lot of love or, 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 or artistry uh, compassion uh, imagination uh, around many education sectors or there is a school max vision that says you know if yeah exams are really important. They're important for their own sake because it really ensures that you learn your subject, you test, you're learning how to cope with pressure, very important in life. Uh, you're learning the skills, you can reproduce it. They are very, very important. They're most important also for getting into university, jobs afterwards, but it's not all about exams. There's also about educating people for life. For life, and there are five ways that I think that independent schools do this really well, and I'm just going to mention them now. And they all go back to Americans or people living in America. And I'll, I'll mention these five, five people now and uh, make a note and get the spelling right when you come to the test. Okay, this afternoon uh, on them. The first is this notion of um, of multiple intelligences. There is a wonderful uh, academic at Harvard called Howard Gardner. And he said, don't ask. Uh, many of you will have heard this before, but I'm going to say it again. It constantly, constantly seems to me to speak of an eternal truth of the human condition. Don't ask how intelligent a child is. Ask rather, how is a child intelligent? Don't ask how intelligent a child is. Wrong question, 20th century question. Ask rather, how is a child intelligent? Because every single child has extraordinary faculties. And as you know, the job of education is to draw people out. And yet so much of education narrows people down to a finishing point. Uh, and they think then at 16, 18, 21, education's over. Wow, I've got my 2-1 from Warwick. Amazing. But actually, education is lifelong and it's as broad as life itself. 
and implanting that spirit of continual learning. So Gardner talks about multiple intelligences. That we have many different faculties and many of our schools which, which just chisel and bludgeon people into a narrow n range of subjects, ignore all of this, and they never will be developed for the rest of their life. It's very, very unusual to find anybody... Oh, learning to, 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 to play the clarinet who hasn't had the chance to, to learn or learning uh, to, to, to how to dance uh, or, or, or learning so many of the multiple intelligences that eight uh, uh, that, that are fundamental. Secondly is well-being. There's a terrible malaise, a rising incident of mental illness amongst young people. Wellington, when we first started teaching, this 10 years ago, we were scorned, particularly by the male. Actually, that did us a lot of good. Um, uh, and also by the Telegraph. The right wing, in particular, thought that this was psycho babble. When some of the editors themselves had children who had mental illness and depression, that opens your heart to all of this. And the truth is that we can avoid children falling off the edge of a waterfall. Once a child falls, or an adult, falls off the edge of a waterfall, has a breakdown, smashed up, it's much harder to put them together than giving them the skills that prevent them ever falling off the edge. That's what positive psychology, key figure here, Marty Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania. And if you want to look at the action for happiness, which I set up with Lord Layard uh, four years ago, we had the Dalai Lama in London last Monday, uh, speaking all day, um, and Dan Goldman, who wrote the book on emotional intelligence. Uh, there's a lot of information there on, on that website about the skills that all of you, as adults, also can learn to live intelligently. To live intelligently. Isn't that a fine thing to do? Third one is, is, is creativity and the imagination and entrepreneurship. And here, uh, the work of Ken Robinson, who's... TED Talk is the most seen TED Talk in the world, Ken Robinson. Uh, and, and he says that, you know, creativity isn't what you do between four and five. You know, in, in, it, it, it goes in every lesson. Um, uh, uh, the teaching of maths can be creative. Uh, the teaching of, of, of rugby or, or netball can be uh, creative. It, it, every single... Um, to be creative is to be alive. It's to be an active learner. Don't tell somebody um, uh, what happens in Henry V. Work out, ask them to think about how Shakespeare might have negotiated his way round. That I've just been on the, because uh, uh, come back from the trenches. The fighting safer, by the way, it was quite safe. Uh, and, 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 you know, there I was asking the, the adults to, to not tell them what happened in the Battle of the Somme, but you get them to imagine uh, what, how you might have fought that battle? What were, what were the problems? Where were the British? Where were the French? Where were the Germans? How might you have conducted that battle yourself? So you get them actively, far more of the brain is being involved than in the dull, regimented lessons uh, where you are simply told the right answer and then you uh, tick. Um, another, uh, so, so, so creativity. We've had multiple intelligences, well-being, positive psychology, imagination, creativity, uh, Gardner, Seligman, Robinson, another uh, on the fourth one, very well-known American, Aristotle, um, uh, on character, character, grit, and resilience. Everything uh, that we need to know about what a good human being is is written there in Aristotle. Oh, by the way, and Confucius, and Buddha, uh, and by Jesus. It, 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 the wisdom... Uh, the wisdom on what it means to be a good leader, a good human being, the skills of grit, resilience, courage, tenacity, wisdom itself, discernment, reflectiveness. That's why mindfulness is so important. So about the first talk I've given for ages where I haven't actually had people doing a mindful exercise, but I'm just saying it will change all our lives, including your relationship with your children and your people you work with. Okay, so, and, and finally, uh, work skills, and back to, uh, to, to, to um, Thoreau. Thoreau, my favorite quotation of all after a lifetime in schools is this. 
by Thoreau, 19th century American, very well known. I doubt if many people here have not heard of it, but again, for all its familiarity, the truth is, it is there inside it. He says, and this does accord with my experience uh, of, of, as a teacher and a head, most people lead lives of quiet desperation, whizzing around the M25, trying to get to parents' evenings, etc., etc., and go to their graves, and go to their graves with their song still inside them. And our job as educator is, educators is to release that song. And that's what a great school, state or independent, will do. And our job as parents is to release the inner song inside the child, not to impose your song or the song you think your child has. Cahill G. Brown says, your children are not your children. I can't find higher wisdom than that about the relationship between a parent and a child. Your children are not your children. They are themselves. And where I see mental problems growing in young people, it's often because the child feels a terrible burden of often unconscious expectation from the parent and fear. Fear they're not going to get into St. Paul's or KCS fear that they're not going to get into Oxford, Cambridge, or UCL, fear that they're not going to get into Goldman Sachs or Teach First. We have a choice about not living a life from fear. Mary, how long have I got? Just give me... Okay. Do, do we, have that, we have that choice uh, about not uh, living a life of fear. Uh, and so fear is very destructive of, of relationships with children. Uh, and if you go as a parent, um, if you fill your child with fear, um, if they worry that they're not going to please you if they don't get this or that into this or that school, that's going to be a real burden. Better to have a child at a non-first division or non-second division university or school and to have them flourishing and coming back and really wanting to see you. It's really interesting that the, the, the teachers who, it took me a long time to work this out, uh, who the children love to be with are the ones who absolutely respect them uh, and let them the space to be the children they are. Uh, the ones who grind and hammer and use fear are the ones who the kids might respect uh, they might be grateful for the quality of their teaching, but they don't have that same uh, real inner love inside. For, for, for children, love is a, is a most natural of uh, expressions. So uh, let me just bring all this to a close. State schools, the best state schools, are now uh, better than uh, many independent schools, and they're free, but they're not enough of them. Uh, and state schools... Uh, who, which I admire enormously, uh, and the people who work in them, and I'm very proud our son's going to teach first himself. Uh, hard to, to, for him to get into that. He worked very hard for it, what he wanted to do. Um, great state schools, but they have three problems that independent schools don't have to the same extent. One is there's that straitjacket that their sole measure of validation is their five A's to C's at, at GCSE, their Ofsted, are they a one or two, or uh, requires improvement. A, a, and the fear, just before the amazing Japan, uh, South Africa game two, two weeks ago, uh, in Brighton, no less, uh, I was sitting uh, next to a, 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 a girl who went to a state school uh, and was passionate French horn player uh, and singer and was working in an academy in uh, West London, but she's going to Australia. Why? Because her head has no space for music. And she, her life is music. Her love is music. Her passion is music. Uh, uh, and so she's going to Australia because there's a school there where she feels that 
what has brought her into the profession will be recognized and valued by the school. How sad that those uh, children who could have been beneficiaries of her love and expertise and passion and time and care won't have that because they're squeezed by the straitjacket imposed by the state. I do think Nikki Morgan is doing well. Um, not certain she really is leadership material yet, um, uh, but I think she really understands as education secretary that you can have excellence in exams and breadth. Next point, our next problem is that they don't have the same resources, particularly of staff. The, 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 the ratio of students to teachers uh, simply is, is about half uh, on average in the independent sector. And third, they don't have the same scope to innovate. And, and this matters because there's a great report out from Harvard uh, two months ago in August. Uh, and, and do have a look at this. It's by David Deming, D-E-M-I-N-G, Harvard um, uh, School of Education, that shows that the growth in jobs over the last uh, uh, 35 years have been predominantly, since 1980, have been predominantly in those professions that do not require the skills that tests themselves uh, excel in. They are employers, and the CBI, we know this, uh, want also the softer skills. It's patronizing to call them softer skills. They're the skills of uh, that, that you value in your own work, that Tatler values in the people who work for Tatler, that, that, that in all your own businesses, that it, it's the ability to work with other people, to, to, to be reliable, to be civil, polite, to, to be measured uh, rather than angry and angsty, and to, 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 to be an energy giver rather than energy sucker, to, 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 to be loyal, supportive, empathetic to other people. And these skills can be developed, and this, these are precisely the skills that uh, employers increasingly are going to want. Why? Because computers, as is happening, has happened in manual labor and is increasingly happening in professional work, are taking over many of uh, precisely uh, the jobs that the exam-driven, test-driven culture excels in the skills that, that they excel in developing. Look at this study. It's frightening. So the government, in it, all its narrowness of both parties, it's not a party political point, it's not just governments in this country, it's governments around the world in their fear uh, of not doing well in international tests, not only are depriving young people from actually being educated, that means you lead out the talents inside you, but also they are preparing them for a world of work that no longer exists. So we need education that does skills and exams, and we need it that does the others. So why then do, uh, do you think uh, that, 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 that uh, independent schools are not more valued? I think it's partly the British disease uh, to, to, to knock the successful. It's partly jealousy. It's partly sadness from those people, including many journalists who now can no longer afford um, uh, the, the independent sector. I think it's partly the independent schools themselves who have, we have allowed our fees to go up and up uh, to unacceptable uh, levels. But it's also a misperception that every school uh, it is uh, a, a, a Westminster uh, or, or a Harrow. Um, actually, the great majority of independent schools across the country are not uh, enormously well off. They're not enormously well endowed. They don't have. Uh, they're not full of uh, uh, of uh, very affluent parents. They are simply like one of the schools I worked at in in Catford called St Dunstan's, where Chucker and Muna. Uh, was um, who will be Labour le leader, by the way, w uh, w was a student. Uh, well, I mean, come on, Corbyn. Um, and, um, and, you know, th th they are, there are many, many independent schools, yet the perception is in the media that they're all tough schools. So I'm going to just leave it there, uh, Mary, and I'm just going to leave, come back to what I said at the beginning. I do think, uh, and we have three children, um, uh, I do think it's very hard to be a good parent because so much of what we do as a parent is subconsciously conditioned by our own experience of our own parenting, and often we don't really examine it. 
So we need, and that's another reason why mindfulness is important, because mindfulness helps us grow in knowledge and understanding of ourselves. That's what it means. It gives us the space to be uh, reflective. Um, there are many different ways of learning how to be reflective. Uh, spending time in church, spending time doing things we love, uh, uh, giving time to ourselves is very important, not allowing ourselves to be frenetic. But the, the genius of parenting is learning to love the child that you have brought into the world for what he or she is rather than what you want them to be. And if that does mean that they want to be uh, a teacher or a plumber or an actor uh, or a, a, a job that isn't going to be well paid, that is fine because what parent who really thought deeply about it would sooner have uh, a mucked up, psychologically damaged, rich child uh, rather than a, a really happy, flourishing uh, child that you've produced and, and come through uh, and, and is working. So love your children in the right way and think about what's in their interest, not in your own. And if you do that, it's still pretty hellish being a parent. <laughs> Why do we do it? Um, uh, but you'll be absolutely in the right zone. Don't forget your exercise books. Thank you all very much.